both Jesus and Paul kept drawing distinctions, differentiations, between those who belong to God and those who belong to the world. And those are really the only two categories that you find in the Bible. You are either the child of God or the child of Satan, which is why Jesus, when speaking to the Pharisees, would say things like, you are of your father, the devil. So there is only the seed of the serpent or the seed of the woman. There is only those who belong to God and have been regenerated, who have the spirit of God, or there is the unregenerate world who does not know the things of God and only knows the spirit of this world. That distinction leaves no room for a gray area in the middle. There's no neutral position in the center. You are either a child of God or you are a child of Satan. And those are the only two categories. Now, Oftentimes, when people speak about Jesus, they will say that Jesus came to be the savior of the world, the whole wide world. Every sinner ever born, they say that those sins were put on Jesus and he died to pay the sin debt of the whole world, all the people who ever lived in the world. And then they will say that the way you are saved is to take advantage of that sacrifice and then implement it on your own behalf, by choosing Jesus, by deciding for yourself that Jesus will be your Lord and your Savior, and then his sacrificial work is implemented on your behalf. Today we're going to look at a couple of verses that demonstrate that that's not how Jesus saw things. In fact, he did not pray for those of the world. He only prayed for those that were given to him by his Father because those were the ones who had the Holy Spirit of God within them who, according to Jesus, the world cannot receive. And once again, there is human incapability. Humans of their own flesh, of their own nature, of their own will, of their own decision-making cannot receive the spirit of truth. That has to be given to people because God chose to give it to particular people. Okay, now, if you're kind of roiling at the fact that I said all those things, stick around because we're going to now look at Jesus saying those things. Let's read. In John chapter 14, Verses 16 and 17, Jesus, talking to his apostles, his disciples, says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may be with you forever. That is, the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it does not see him or know him, but you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. In those two short verses, Jesus just drew a distinction again between the world and those that are his, those who were chosen before the foundation of the earth, those who were elected to salvation and then given to Christ Jesus. He differentiates between those two groups. One group received the spirit of truth. By the way, it's important to read that they received the spirit of truth. They didn't go grab the spirit of truth. They didn't assume the spirit of truth. They didn't take on the spirit of truth. They didn't desire and will the spirit of truth to such a degree that God gave in and allowed them to have the spirit of truth. They were given the spirit of truth. They were the recipients of that gift from God. And that gift of God, the world cannot receive. Can't do it. Human inability. Human inability in capability. But then he also says to his people, in contrast to the world that cannot receive the Spirit, 
He said, you will receive that spirit. He will abide with you. That means he will stay with you. And he will be in you. In so much of the Old Testament, we see examples like King Saul, who once in a while the Spirit of God would land on King Saul so that Saul would prophesy, leading the children of the prophets, the sons of the prophets, to ask the question, oh, is Saul now among the prophets? But then the Spirit of God departed. He left Saul. And so that is the Old Testament example of the Spirit of God, who sometimes would intercede in human life and give people extraordinary or prophetic abilities. Jesus, speaking to his apostles, said, the spirit of truth that I'm going to ask the Father for, the spirit of truth that is given to you from God the Father, is a spirit that will abide with you, stay with you. He's not going to depart from you, and he's going to be in you. For that reason, because he stays with you and is in you, you know him. And Jesus said, the world does not know him. And that's why the world doesn't understand the Bible. That's why the world doesn't understand Christianity. That's why the world is so adamantly opposed to all things biblical, to all things Christian, because they don't know the spirit that is necessary in order to discern these spiritual things. But wait, we're not quite done there. Not only did Jesus state that the world cannot receive the spirit of truth, but now he's going to say that he does not pray for them. He does not intercede for them. And that means that when they stand before God, they have no intercessor. They have no peacemaker between them and God. They stand there and their sins utterly and completely from start to finish are counted against them and they are held eternally guilty. Here's what he said. In John 17, starting at verse 6, Jesus is praying to God. Prosukomai is the Greek word for pray. It means to ask, to supplicate toward God. I have manifested your name to the men whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they have come to know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words which you gave me, I have given to them, and they received them, and they truly understood that I came forth from you, and they believed that you sent me. I ask, I pray, on their behalf, I do not ask on behalf of the world. The King James renders that, I do not pray for the world, but for those that you have given me. I do not ask on behalf of the world, but of those whom you have given me, for they are yours, and all things that are mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. Okay, so in those two passages, we saw that the world cannot receive the Holy Spirit of truth, and receiving that Holy Spirit is the regenerating action of God that we know as being born again. Without being born again, Jesus said in John 3, you cannot see the kingdom of God. So it is absolutely necessary that you be born again. But Jesus said that not everyone is going to be born again. Not everyone is going to receive the spirit of truth. The people who do receive that spirit are the people that were given to him by God from the beginning because they belong to God. God chose them and then God gave them to his son. And then Jesus said, I pray for them specifically. 
I pray for these people that you have given me. I do not pray for the world. And the most natural worldly reaction to that is, that's not fair. I don't like Christianity. I don't like your God. I don't like the fact that your Savior doesn't save everybody and give everybody an equal shot at eternity. Instead, he picks and he chooses and he elects, and that's not fair. But the last thing you want God to be is fair. If God is fair, then all human beings, every single one of them, from top to bottom, are all going to be judged eternally and end up in the lake of fire. That would be fair, given the biblical anthropology, given how sinful we humans actually are. That would be fair. You don't want fairness from God. You want mercy from God. You want grace from God. Because given the natural state of human beings, and given that Jesus is not the intercessor, that Jesus did not pray, that the spirit of truth did not inhabit everybody, if anybody winds up before God and does not fry, if anybody winds up in his glory for all of eternity, it can only be because God did for them the thing they could not do for themselves. In other words, as I keep on saying, and will say for the rest of my life, it has to be grace.